All right, we're going to pick up our study of the book of Acts in chapter 15 now, but every now and then I just like to do a brief review and kind of lay out some of the ground rules so we don't, uh, we don't get lost in our study. Acts, the book of Acts, covers about 35 years of history, from a, about 2930 A.D. to 64, 65 A.D., somewhere in that neighborhood. The book is primarily historical, it's a history, and the term transitional certainly applies to this book because there are many transitions that are uh, viewed here in this book. We go from the Old Testament to the New Testament. We go from the focus on the nation of Israel uh, and the kingdom to the church and to the body of Christ. Uh, we see the primary focus early in the book, uh, the Jewish people primarily, and we see that as the book goes on, the Bible is, uh, the scriptures are to go, the gospel is to go to all the world. So we see more and more Gentiles being brought into the picture, particularly through the um, journeys of Paul the Apostle and Barnabas and Silas, etc. From chapters 13 to 28, there are three major uh, missionary journeys spoken of that Paul the Apostle was involved in, plus uh, we're going to see here in this particular chapter the council at Jerusalem, and then the last major theme of the book is Paul's trip to uh, Rome and his appeal to Caesar. So uh, we are well past the halfway point in the study of our text, and uh, we're going to pick things up, as I said here, in chapter number 15 in the book of Acts, and that would be page number 181 in your notebook. So please follow along in the notes if you would, and I'll try to keep you there. We get to Acts chapter 15, and about 20 years now has transpired since the day of Pentecost to what we're about to read uh, of here. Of course, uh, uh, Paul the Apostle was converted, came to Christ somewhere about five, within five years after the book of uh, the beginning of the book of Acts, Acts chapter two in Pentecost. So Paul has been saved about 15 years now when we get into this particular council at Jerusalem. But if you look at your notes, we're gonna talk about the issue of legalism. That really is the subject that is discussed here and uh, hammered out in Jerusalem at this council. The word does not occur. That is, the word, Jeru the word legalism does not occur in the Bible. It's a term Christians use to describe a doctrinal position that emphasizes a system of rules and regulations for achieving both salvation and spiritual growth. So we have to be, we have to be careful when we use the term legalism because um, legalism, strictly speaking, would be rules and regulations lead to salvation. In other words, a works-based salvation is strictly legalism. Now, we use that term loosely when we're talking about Christians who might bring their own personal preferences to bear on us. Someone expects me to do something, some preference that they have, that I need to do what, what they think is right to keep me in a right relationship with God. So uh, in il the illustration in the, this chapter is simply this, that there were Jews after the resurrection of Christ, after the preaching of the gospel of the grace of God, that believed that if you were going to come to Christ as Savior, you really had to go through uh, the Old Testament law. So if you professed belief in Messiah, then what you needed to do is you needed to be circumcised as a, 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 to, to qualify, and then you needed to follow the Old Testament law to be a good Christian. And of course, the debate of this chapter is all about that, and it's settled here. So legalism, legalism, what is that? Legalism strictly is salvation by works. Loosely, the term is used by Christians when one Christian tries to impose his set of personal beliefs and preferences on another individual. Even true believers can be, second paragraph, legalistic. We're instructed rather to be gracious to one another, 
Sadly, there are those who feel so strongly about non-essential doctrines, in fact, they may not even be doctrines, that they will run others out of their fellowship, not even allowing the expression of another viewpoint. Um, musical preferences are often uh, uh, the issue of discussion. What kind of music do you like? What kind of music do you have in church? Uh, dress often is a uh, focal point of legalistic uh, discussions. The Bible uh, standard is moderation, no doubt. And boy, that's kind of, it's kind of loose, isn't it? So whether or not women should or should not wear uh, pants, oftentimes that becomes a topic of discussion. Uh, whether or not men should have some kind of facial hair, I've heard that as a discussion uh, of legalism. And uh, those things, I believe, are preferences. Personally, I believe they're preferences. And I've uh, had discussions over the years about those things, but those are preferences as far as I'm concerned. And I'm not going to tell people how to dress other than that they should... Um, there's a term that you, you don't need to be a spectacle, you know, when you dress. If you're trying to direct attention to yourself through your clothing or through your appearance in some way, you may be headed in the wrong direction, particularly if you're taking your clothes off, I, I might add, whether you're male or whether you're female. Well, anyway, let's move on. We'll talk about it more in a little bit. I've probably already ruffled some feathers with this. There's an outline of uh, the second half of the book there in the middle of the page, and then we've outlined chapter number 15. We see the dissension in the first five verses, then witnesses testify on both sides of the issue. Peter, Barnabas, Paul, James, they all have something to say about this. Then James brings a conclusion and offers his counsel or advice. A decision is then made, Paul and Barnabas are then commissioned to take the decision back to the church at Antioch. Others join them to validate this decision from Jerusalem, and then the plan is executed. That's where we uh, end our outline of chapter number 15. So let's do some reading here, okay? Let's uh, read the first five verses. It says in verse 1, that, And certain men which came down from Judea, taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. Let's settle this once and for all. Obviously, this was a great uh, problem and issue in the early church. Um, certainly the book of Hebrews uh, is written to help people understand um, how Judaism fit into this whole Christian paradigm. The book of James also offers a great deal of advice. But we see here in chapter 15 this council trying to determine the part that circumcision keeping the law of Moses, all of those things have what part they have in salvation for an individual who comes to Christ as Savior. Are they important or are they not? And this is not settled quickly. Now, there's a decision that is made here, but several years later, we read in the book of Galatians that Paul had to confront Peter and Barnabas because they still were not practicing what they were preaching. I, I encourage you to go to the book of Galatians, start in chapter number 2 and uh, verse 1, and you'll see this is an issue between Paul and Peter, particularly in the 11th through the 16th verses of that particular chapter. So this wasn't easily or quickly settled. The Jews had a great tradition that went back hundreds, 1,500 years, and they weren't going to forget that and lay that aside quickly. They still were looking for how their Judaism made contributions to, to their own personal salvation and whether or not Gentiles 
coming into the faith, into faith in Christ, whether or not they were going to uh, have to be required to go through Jewish rituals and rites. So we're picking this up in verse uh, number three. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. When they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But, here we go, there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees. This is a, a, a group, of a small group, a sect, a small group of the Pharisees who are very orthodox, very conservative in their beliefs, and they were very well educated in the law. They believed that it was needful to circumcise these new converts and to command them to keep the law of Moses. As I said, it was very difficult for some Jewish Christians to accept that Gentiles could be brought into the church as equal partners without first coming through circumcision, the law of Moses, etc. It was one thing to accept the occasional a proselyte into Judaism, but it was something else when there was hundreds and maybe even thousands of Gentiles who were responding to the invitation to come to Christ as Messiah. What takes place in verse 1 is played out in one form or another over and over again in church history. You must go through our way or our system to gain true salvation. When you look at uh, uh, cults or the cultists, specifically I can uh, think of the Jehovah Witnesses, you have to do it their way. If it's the Mormons, you have to do it their way. There are even a number of, quote, Christian organizations or denominations that believe that you have to go through them or go through their um, hierarchy their rites, rituals, protocols to actually uh, gain or achieve salvation. So this isn't, this isn't a new problem, this, this, obviously, today. Uh, this is an old problem that goes all the way back into the book of Acts in chapter number 15. Paul and Barnabas were taught no such thing as they traveled 900 miles on their first missionary journey. They were not teaching You had to be circumcised. You had to keep the law of Moses. The Judaizers, that's a term that's commonly used by commentators and Christians. The Judaizers were those who brought confusion to the young church and to new believers by mandating circumcision, mandating the keeping of the law. You can't be saved unless you come through the way we came here. We came through circumcision. We came through the law. You must do the same if you're going to truly be uh, a Christian. Verse number six. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. This apparently is a reference back to the 10th chapter and the conversion of Cornelius, which uh, we see is the, the, the main topic of not only chapter 10, but uh, chapter number 11. And God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us, the Jews, and them, purifying their hearts by faith, by faith. I would add, I'm not adding to Scripture, by faith alone, alone. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? We didn't even keep the law. We couldn't keep the law. The law was never given to bring an individual to salvation. The law was given to show us the exceeding sinfulness of sin. It, the law was given to show mankind that, no, that all men are sinners. N- there's none righteous. There's no not one. Romans chapter 3, 10, 11, 12, right down through 
verse 19 that says that all the world might be stopped. All the world might become guilty. Why? In the face of the fact that no one could keep the Old Testament law. No one was perfect. So the whole idea of circumcision and keeping the law to bring salvation, it was impossible anyway. The, the, the Old Testament law was guaranteed failure when it came to salvation. It wasn't the law's purpose to save anybody. Galatians 3 says that it was a schoolmaster, it was a teacher to bring us unto Christ. So anyway, we pick things up here in uh, uh, verse number 6, the apostles and elders came together. This is the first of many church councils that followed that, that the same kinds of important Christian doctor, doctrines were hammered out over the next many years of the history of the church. Uh, Peter, it's interesting that he stands up here. It's not unusual for Peter to take, a, to take the pulpit or to stand up and, and grab everybody's attention. The thing that really, is, uh, that really uh, concerns me is that six, seven years later, Peter still isn't practicing this the way he should. That's what Galatians chapter 2 is all about. When Paul literally had to confront Peter and say, man, you're messed up. You're, you're acting like a hypocrite. That's what that chapter is all about. Read verse 16, because Galatians 2.16 is the conclusion that these people came to here at this council seven years earlier. So we look at uh, verse number 12. If you move down on page 183, then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders had wrought what God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. So they're sharing their testimony. They've uh, been on a 900-mile missionary journey. They have not pre been preaching circumcision, keep the Old Testament law. Paul himself was a Pharisee. They were not doing that. And now they're sharing with this council the, uh, their exploits, what God has been doing with them and through them. As we turn the page 184, you can see uh, the uh, emphasis on signs and wonders. Uh, signs and wonders were very much a part of the early church. And what they did is they served to vindicate or validate the ministry of these early ministers, these early apostles and preachers. We see Acts 14 quoted there, signs and wonders, a couple times. We see in uh, Romans chapter uh, 10, 10, it says there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. So all of these things, this issue of signs and wonders and the preaching and ministry of Paul and Barnabas and the fact that there's no difference between Jew and Jew, these were all things that were being brought uh, to the attention of the people at the council. Here in the middle of page 184, here is Galatians 2.16. Let me read it. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. So Paul is spelling this out in no uncertain terms. But this is several years after what we're reading in Galatians, uh, excuse me, in Acts chapter 15. Not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified, justified in God's sight. Uh, justification, a simple definition would be this, just as though you've never sinned. That's how God looks at the Christian who has been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, born again, forgiven of all their sins, fit, ready for eternal life. You are justified in and by the blood of Jesus Christ. So we pick up in verse 13 in Acts chapter 15, and after they had held their peace, James answered, he's listening to all of this, James answered saying, men and brethren, listen to me, hearken unto me. Simeon, or Simon Peter, same person, hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles, Acts chapter 10, to take out of them a people for his name. 
And to this agree the words of the prophets. In other words, we shouldn't be surprised that the gospel went to the Gentiles because it was written, After this I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. So, what we've listed there at the bottom of page 184 and over well into page 185 are many of the passages that are listed in the Old Testament that promised that the gospel would ultimately cover or go to the Gentiles. That the Lord God Jehovah wasn't just the God of Israel, it was the God of the whole, He is the God of the whole earth. He is the creator. He's the creator of all men. And Christ has brought salvation for all, not just to the Jews. You can see, again, I hate to continue to bring this up, but the confusion there was uh, in the early church, their unwillingness to let go of the fact that they were special people and the Gentiles were on a one rung lower on the ladder, so to speak, and that the Gentiles had, were different, had to do something to become, if they ever could be, equal with the Jews. So this whole concept had to be, had to be uh, addressed over and over and over again. Again, we can look at 184, 185. You can see all these, uh, these uh, um, passages from the Old Testament prophesying the fact that the Lord was not just the God of Israel, but the God of all. 185 at the bottom, we pick up in verse number 19. Verse number 19, Wherefore my sentence is, that we trouble not them. In other words, this is my conclusion, my sentence. You go to, you go to a uh, court hearing appearance, and uh, sometimes the, uh, if the person is guilty, they are sentenced immediately. Sometimes there is a, a time in between the guilty uh, judgment and the sentencing. But the sentencing is the conclusion, okay? So here we use the term, sentence in that sense. Wherefore, my conclusion is that we trouble not them, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Back off, guys. We're putting a yoke of legalism on them that God never intended. That's what the message is. But that we write unto them that they abstain from, these are the things that were important, pollution of idols, from fornication, sexual sin, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So there were very few things that they uh, wanted to say to the Gentiles. James says that God knows what he is doing even when we are confused in verse 18. The Gentile has been around long before there was a Jew, by the way. We know that as you study Scripture. God has never left them out of his grand scheme of things. So we see the definition in, uh, of sentence. We see that James' advice is simple. Don't trouble the Gentiles. Write them to abstain from these things. And then I've given you a note there that you might take a moment and read. Um, there's a lot of cultural stuff that when you just read through the New Testament you're, uh, or the Old Testament for that matter, whenever you read any book of antiquity, um, it is important if you can understand a little bit about the culture and the background of what you're reading. Oftentimes we don't have the time to do that. We're, we're looking at a survey of the book of Acts and we really haven't taken the time to Maybe we could take three or four weeks just to study the culture of all of this, just to kind of get a good backdrop for, for what we are reading um, and, and what was going on in the world at that time. We haven't done that, so that's a little bit of a handicap when you're doing a survey. You can always go back 
to do further study and uh, see um, you know, the cultural backdrop of the situations, the circumstances that we're reading of. Verse 21 says, For Moses is read in the synagogues. Why would that be? To be a good testimony to the Jews and, uh, and we're not to use them to be distracted and stumble. Look at verse 21. Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. This was uh, important. Many Jews already are spiritually educated and lean in the direction of Christ. They have come through uh, the Old Testament and they've been introduced to the fact that circumcision and um, that keeping the Old Testament law are not necessary. So there are many people that have already been exposed to this kind of teaching and are leading, leaning in that direction. Those of the sect of the Pharisees who believed they were making a critical mistake. They were looking at Israel's history under the law, maybe with the eyes of nostalgia and not truth. If they would have carefully and truthfully considered Israel's failure under the law, they would not have been so quick to put the Gentiles under the law also. And certainly that's the conclusion of what's taking place here, that, hey, you're putting the Gentiles under the law? We blew it ourselves. That isn't the issue. The law only showed us the exceeding sinfulness of sin. The law was given that every mouth might be stopped and all the world might become guilty before God. The law was given to be a schoolmaster, again, to show us our humanity and our inability to save ourselves, to bring us ultimately to the real solution for the sin problem, that is, the death of Christ on the cross, the shedding of his blood, his burial, and his resurrection. At the bottom of 186, verse 22, Then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. It pleased them uh, to, uh, let's make sure that we're all on the same page the decision was made to send Paul and Barnabas, members of it, the Antiochian church, with Judas and Silas, who were leaders in the Jerusalem church, back to Antioch to help settle the controversy. So there would be four people who would be testifying to what actually took place here in Jerusalem at this council. They wrote letters by them, verse 23, after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren sent greeting unto the brethren, which are the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. They were doing this on their own. They were uh, uh, loose cannons, so to speak. Men... Uh, excuse me, in verse 25, it seemed, it seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye do well, fare ye well. So um, the plan is four people are going to take the sentence, the conclusion of the Council of Jerusalem. They're going to go back to Antioch, several hundred miles, and they're going to share with them the conclusion. This is the real deal. No, the Gentiles do not need to be circumcised, and no, they do not need to keep the Old Testament law to be saved. What they need is they need to be justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. They need to come to Christ by faith alone. Verse 30, so when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, 
And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. And after they had tarried there a space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. Of course, later on, uh, Paul and Silas become an evangelistic team. When Paul and Barnabas have their disagreement and their falling out about John Mark, when that um, all takes place, um, Silas becomes Paul's partner. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So the movement is growing. There are more and more qualified leaders, teachers, preachers, evangelists. We see that. Again, we're dealing with uh, about 20 years after uh, Pentecost, 20 years after the crucifixion of Christ. Legalism, if you go to the middle of page 188, legalism is a sometimes pejorative term referring to, and we're just reminding you the topic of this particular session, referring to an overemphasis on discipline of conduct or legal ideas, usually implying an allegation of misguided rigor, pride, superficiality, the neglect of mercy, and ignorance of the grace of God, or emphasizing the letter over the Spirit. Obedience to the law is overemphasized to the neglect of grace. That's uh, four pretty powerful sentences summing up the, uh, the, the meaning of legalism and uh, kind of de defining the terminology there also and giving some illustrations. Legalism comes in at least three different varieties. You've got to get saved our way, our way. If you are truly saved, you will do things the way we do them in our church. We will provide you a list of what we expect of you so that you can keep your salvation to be part of our fellowship. Number three, you may be saved, however, if you do not practice or live or worship or fellowship the way we do, you can't be a good Christian, a good Christian. Let me give you some illustrations, and I'm not going to argue any of these points. These are just illustrations. You can't be a good Christian and own a television set. I've heard people say that. You can't be a good Christian and go to Hollywood movies. I've heard people say that. Now, to be very honest with you, we need to be very careful what we listen to and what we watch. I totally agree with that. And I ag agree with the fact that if you are in doubt, that you ought to walk away from it. If you're sitting watching a television program and it's lewd, it's uh, uh, presenting immorality in a positive light, probably ought to turn it off, okay? That's my opinion. And I think I could probably back that up with some scripture. But I'm not going to tell you that all television programming is immoral. I'm not going to tell you that every movie or video that ever was made is immoral. And I'll just stop right there. There's plenty of places I could go with that, and I'm not going to do it. Legalism. Some things that need to be said, these people who practice some form of legalism make salvation and sanctification more difficult by adding certain things listed at the bottom of 188. The text tells me this, 189. Legalism is trouble, it's a yoke, it's rooted in pride, that's my belief. Legalism intends to control others. It can be divisive. It can be and is, if it's true legalism, it's heretical. Oftentimes it's hypocritical and inconsistent and legalism is unbearable. Let me give you one inconsistency. Now, I can't speak for all Amish people because they have all different kinds of beliefs among the different kinds of Amish people. But I've heard 
that there are Amish people who would never have a telephone or be hooked up to electricity or ever have a telephone in their home because it's worldly. But they would have a telephone down at the end of their driveway and use that. They would never own an automobile, but they would ride in yours. Things like that are puzzling to me. I don't understand the thinking, and to me, it seems hypocritical to think that having a phone telephone in your house is wrong, but having a telephone at the end of your driveway would be okay, as, as long as it's not on your property and in your home. Or an automobile would be wrong. It would be wrong to own the automobile, but you can take a ride in an automobile if you're offered one. Things like that stymie me. We have to be careful not to fall into a trap, though, of easy, believe, uh, easy believism. I wrote some things in my notes. We need to have a balance of liberty and license. And what I mean by that is I don't mean that we ought to be licensed to do whatever we want. But the balance of this is found somewhere in between the, uh, this legalistic approach and this all-grace approach where everything is okay, don't worry about it, all your sins have been forgiven, you can do whatever is a Christian now, it's all been taken care of. That is a license, and that is, just as, um, that is just as wrong as being legalistic. All right, let's take a break here in just a couple moments, and um, we'll move on to chapter 16 shortly.